uh, try to explain this evening what it's not and the rest of the week what it is. Um, the economy, the world economy, is very much in the news. I got this story off the internet uh, last week and it's uh, made the headlines, I'm sure, in newspapers all around the globe. And the title is, Japan's Crumbling Economy Enters Recession. Uh, Japan, of course, is the second largest economy in the world, and it has met the academic definition of a recession. Uh, that is, it uh, shows negative growth for two quarters, for six months, and that's the official definition of a recession. And you see news of this sort, some good news, some bad news. Some people are saying as we approach the year 2000, the news is going to get much, much worse. Um, and some people have the idea <coughs> that this is economics. And the first thing I want to emphasize is that it's not, this is not economics, this is history. This is history. It's business history. There's a big difference between economics and history. And when you read something in the paper, it's history. It's about the past. Japan entered a recession, meeting the formal academic definition of a recession. And people frequently mistake economics for history. Frequently mistake it. Now, history is very entertaining. Uh, you can read biographies of people. You can read histories of the Great Depression or the great uh, captains of industry in the U.S. in the 19th century early 20th century. Uh, we have one at the late 20th century, Bill Gates, a captain of industry of the magnitude of, uh, say, John D. Rockefeller a uh, hundred years ago. And he's facing the same sort of opposition that John Rockefeller faced a hundred years ago from the government. And the government broke up uh, the Rockefeller Standard Oil Trust a hundred years ago. And now they're attempting to break up the Microsoft Computer Software Trust a hundred years later. Uh, read some good biographies of these captains of industry. Very entertaining. And you'll learn a lot by reading history. But don't mistake it for economics. Economics is not history. Economics is something quite different from history. It's a good approach, though, to uh, introducing you uh, to economics. And some of the readings I have on the syllabus, and I hope you've all picked up a copy of the syllabus for the week. Some of the readings I have, in fact, many of them, have to do with history. Uh, <clears throat> the last one there called The Coming of Christ is actually uh, a new title called Christ and Civilization. And it's about history. Uh, what is Christian philosophy is not. The next to the last one there. That is philosophy. Civilization of the Protestant Reformation is history. A different yardsticks is ethics. These All these essays are different things. The communist idea, political theory. A property, political theory. Not yours to give history. There isn't a single reading I've given on there that qualifies as economics. But it is all relevant in some sense to what we think of when we think of as economics. But I want to make clear that economics is not the study of the past. It is not the study of the past. It is not history. Not by any means. Some people who want to get their graduate degrees, their PhDs in economics, find that the best way or the easiest way of doing that is to get a degree in history instead, economic history or business history, rather than economics proper. I'll explain why a little bit later. In fact, uh, it's the next item on the list there where I say economics is not math. Economics is not math. Pick up an economics textbook. Have any of you studied economics in college, at the college level, okay? You probably ran into a little math. If you pick up a standard economic textbook, you'll see that it's filled with equations. 
lots of complex equations. In fact, you have to be a mathematician to get a graduate degree in economics in the United States today. That's why many people, rather than doing all that tough math, go into economic history rather than economics. Because the prevailing philosophy in the universities is that economics is something or involves a great deal of mathematics. And we're not talking about simple arithmetic. We're talking about higher math. Maybe you've read the newspaper and you've run across the phrase, the economic models. Or perhaps you've heard the word econometrics. Uh, these phrases refer to the mathematics that is used heavily in conventional economics, secular economics. Mathemat or economic models are not little model airplanes or things like that. It's a whole collection of equations an economic model is. And what they usually do is they feed those equations into a computer, program a computer, then give it certain statistics and certain commands, and that model will make projections about the functioning of the economy six months or a year down the road. They're trying to anticipate what's going to happen to the economy. So when Congress is debating with the president about whether we should uh, cut the budget, balance the budget, increase taxes, each branch of government has its own computers, and each branch of government has its own equations. And those equations are different. They each have their own economic model. So the Republicans will feed the statistics that they collect into one set of equations, and they come out with one result. The Democrats will feed statistics into their set of equations, their economic model, and they'll come out with a different result in the White House. So you have this continual clash between the Republicans and Democrats, between the White House uh, and Congress over what the future of the economy is going to look like. And it's all based on the idea that economics is somehow mathematics. It's not. It's similar in some ways, but it's not mathematics either. It's not history. Economics is not history. It's not a study of the past, nor is it mathematics. Uh, it's not higher calculus or whatever. Thirdly, uh, economics isn't psychology. Many people get confused on this. They think, well, if it's not history <coughs> and it's not math, it must be psychology. Um, psychology, I suppose, is the study of um, human behavior why people act the way they do, uh, what are the motivations for their acting the way they do. Um, and some people mistakenly think that economics is really a branch of psychology. Um, Marx was one of those, Karl Marx. He's a name that we'll talk about uh, in the second hour this evening very influential writer in the 19th century. Uh, but economics, again, is not psychology. We're not studying what motivates people. We're not studying uh, the relationship. Speaking of Christian psychology, we're not talking about the relationship between the heart and the soul, or the soul and the spirit, or all of those things in the mind. None of those things is economics. They may belong to psychology or Christian psychology, but they're not economics. Economics is not the study of motivation. It's not the study of human behavior. Nor is it ethics. Some of the readings you have uh, have to do with ethical issues. And I hope you'll take the time to do all those readings this week. They're not very long. Some of them are even entertaining. Um, but economics is not ethics. And, and people very frequently think that it is. And this is not to say that economics has nothing to do with ethics. All of these things have something to do with each other. History has something to do with psychology. 
Mathematics has something to do with economics. But let's not confuse all these dis disciplines. And economics is not ethics. It's not the study of how people ought to behave. Ethics is the study of what you ought to do. Right and wrong. What makes an action right? What makes an action wrong? How do we distinguish between right and wrong? All of these are ethical questions. Now, we don't discuss those in economics. But again, ethics and economics are related. But they're not the same. Economics as a discipline uh, it does not deal with values in that sense. We'll be talking about the word value later in the week. But we'll, we'll not be using it in an ethical sense as a moral value. A value in economics is something quite different from a moral value. And it's important not to confuse those ideas. But economics itself, as a distinct discipline, is not ethics or morals or morality or whatever you want to call it. Now, certain ethical, certain economic policies, sometimes you'll hear them denounced as immoral. Uh, people will say deficit spending, spending by the government uh, more than it takes in in taxes, is immoral. Or taxation itself, if it's so high uh, that it affects stealing from people, is immoral. They're making moral judgments or ethical judgments, and they're applying them to uh, the ethics of government spending and the government taxation. And all of that is fine. You can make ethical judgments about those matters. But let's be clear, you're not making an economic judgment about those matters. It's an ethical judgment about those matters. There are many such ethical judgments or ethical commands in Scripture. For instance, we're told that a worker is worthy of his hire, and you're not to withhold the worker's wages. Those are ethical commands, they're moral commands, and they obviously have something to do with business, the relationship between employers and employees. But they're ethics, they're not economics. Those are ethical issues. Economics is something quite different. Uh, some people think that, well, if it has nothing to do with, if economics has nothing to do with morality or ethics or values, then economics must be dirty. That is, uh, it must be, if not uh, an immoral discipline, then at least a distasteful one, something that you don't talk about in polite company, these questions or mixed company. And this attitude is, is very common in some circles, that discussions of economic theory and applied economics uh, are somehow off limits for people who are high-minded. And this crops up in the very odd places sometimes. So you don't have uh, people discussing, for example, of the finances of a church because it's somehow not edifying, it's not spiritual to talk about financial matters in a church. Uh, that's, that's something that if, if, if it's not uh, immoral or dirty or whatever, it's, it's something that's better left unsaid in polite company, those sorts of things. Um, well, economics uh, as a discipline, as ethics as a discipline, deals with perhaps some very distasteful and some very immoral activities. But that doesn't make the discipline immoral. Uh, in ethics, which is a legitimate discipline in, in academia, the study of ethics, uh, you talk about many unsavory things. That doesn't make the discipline unsavory or dirty or immoral. You have to distinguish the discipline from some of the things that might be discussed by an ethicist or by an economist. And you have to see that the discipline itself is fine. The discipline itself 
uh, is not dirty. The discipline itself is not immoral, even though some of the things that might crop up uh, might be questionable. Um, some people say, well, why do we need to study economics at all? Isn't it just common sense? Isn't economics just common sense? And some of you, uh, those of you who heard me, uh, I guess, three years ago now, uh, probably recall this example that I give of common sense thinking. And uh, it has some uh, practical applications. Suppose you graduate from college. I'll give you an example, common sense thinking here. Suppose you graduate from college and you have two job offers, uh, job A and job B, company A and company B. And uh, the offers are identical. They start you at the same salary. They give you the same benefits, same vacation. Um, you would be equally happy working at either company A or company B. They both start you at $20,000 a year. Both companies. The only difference between company A and company B is their policy of giving you raises. That's the only difference between these two. See, some of you are smiling. Perhaps you've heard this before. That's the only difference between these two job offers. Uh, company A here gives you $500 semi-annually. Company B gives you $2,000 annually. Now, people say we don't have to study economics. All we need to do is use our common sense here and decide which job we're going to take. The starting salary is the same. The benefits are the same. You'd be equally happy working for both, company, both companies. Which one do you choose? Many people, perhaps not all, but many people will rely on their common sense and say, obviously, you choose the one with a $2,000 annual raise. Obviously, that's the one you choose. Much, much better deal than the $500 semi-annual. Well, let's see. Let's do a little bit of analytical thinking here. And what I'm going to do by drawing these lines on here is show you what you earn every six months. These are six-month periods here. This is the first six months, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. What do you earn in job A here at company A in the first six months? $10,000. You see how that number, how we came up with that number? It's half, six months, half of your annual salary. Okay, what do you earn at company B? 10,000. Okay, so far so good. Really doesn't make any difference so far. How about the second six months? What do you earn? 10,5. Got your $500 raise. What do you earn the second six months over here at company B? Ten. Well, here you are at the end of your first year. Which job has paid you more money? Company A. Doesn't that seem odd? Wasn't the common sense answer that you take this job, Company B? But at the end of the first year, you're $500 behind. Let's go on to the third six-month period. What do you make at uh, Company A here during the first half of the second year, the third six-month period? 
11. What do you make at company B during the first six months of the second year, the third period? What is it? Louder. Somebody said it. You make 11. You see why you make 11? You get your $2,000 raise, takes your salary up to 22000 divide it in half, you make 11000 during the first half of the second year. What do you make at Company A here? Eleven five. Get your five hundred dollar raise. What do you make at Company B? You make eleven. What's happening? You've made five hundred dollars more in the second year at Company A than at Company B. What's happening? What happened to common sense? This is a very simple illustration. People would think that uh, people who advocate common sense would say this is the sort of thing that we can rely on for making decisions. We can rely on common sense in these things. But when you actually look at it, you get quite a different result. Now, as the gentleman here who three years ago didn't believe this, and went home and put it on his computer and ran it out for a century. <laughs> I guess he's not here this evening. I don't recall his name, but I still have the computer printout. He did not believe it. He, he ran, went home and put it in the computer, these same stipulations, and ran it out for a century. And sure enough, every year for a century, you earned $500 more at job A than you do at job B. Uh, so you're two years into it now, you've made $1,000 more in this job, in job A, than you did, would in job B. Uh, this is, I intend to use this illustration to make the argument that economics is not common sense. We do not rely on common sense in economics. We use something a little bit more uh, strict, a little bit more rigorous than common sense. So there's a different illustration you might use, um, and perhaps you've read this or heard this uh, elsewhere. Suppose I were to offer you a job and say, um, uh, I can pay you either of two ways. Uh, at the end of the month, and we'll assume, what is it, the month is June, at the end of the month, uh, I'll give you uh, $25,000 for doing this job, or I will pay you on a daily basis. Uh, I'll give you uh, a penny the first day and two pennies the second day, and, and I'll double it every day. So the third day, you get four cents, and the, the fifth day, you get eight cents, and so on and so forth. Um, and I, I leave it up to you which way you want to be paid. Do you want to take that guaranteed $25,000 at the end of June? Or shall we start out with a penny a day? Well, you know, just looking at it like that, sounds like $25,000 is a lot more for a month's work than a penny a day. But sit down and do the arithmetic this evening. Figure it out. How much you would make in a day, in a month of 30 days, Starting at one cent for the first day, two cents for the second day, four cents for the third day, and, four, and so on. Figure out how much you would make. Quite different from $25,000. Now, if you're an employer, maybe we have some employers in the room. If you're an employer, uh, this illustration can benefit you. You can, if you have an employee who's applied for a job you're offering, you can offer the employee, say, now here's your, here's your package, here's your benefits, here's your vacation, um, and here's your salary, and I'll give you the choice, as the employee, which way you want to take your raises. You want to take $500 semi-annually or $2,000 annually. Now, if your employee jumps 
That's the idea of saying, well, I'll take $2,000 annually, obviously. Um, you're going to save $500 a year as an employer. Uh, but you may not be getting as sharp as an employee as you think <laughs> you want. If, however, the employee says, well, let me think about that, and comes back and says, no, I'll, I'll take the $500 semi-annual raise, uh, then it's going to cost you $500 a year more as an employer. But you may be getting more than your money's worth if your employee sits down and figures it out. He's going to be worth that $500 a year uh, for that case. So economics isn't common sense. Uh, economics, what we do in Christian economics is we start with Scripture, and we proceed by logical deduction from Scripture. We don't fly by the seat of our pants. We don't go with our gut feelings. We don't go with our common sense. We start with Scripture, and we proceed by logic from Scripture. So it's not common sense. Uh, economics, the last thing I have on the list here, although it's not the last one I'll talk about. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, these are six-month increments. So he's got, see, in this second year, he's got his $22,000. He's got his $2,000 increase. Starts at 20, goes to 22, and he gets half of that in the first six months and half in the second six months. We have a skeptic. We always do. <laughs> Any other questions before we go ahead? Um, economics is not the queen of the sciences is the last thing I have listed here. And what do we mean by that? Well, back in the Middle Ages, uh, theology was regarded as the queen of the sciences. Theology. Theology was at the, the top of the pyramid, as it were. All other disciplines, philosophy, um, biology, chemistry, ethics, you name it, was subordinate to theology. Theology was the study of God. And all these things perhaps contributed in some way to our understanding of God, but only in an inferior way. Theology was the leader. It was the queen of the sciences. But theology hasn't been regarded as queen of the sciences for a long time. But there are economists today in universities and colleges who seem to think that economics has replaced theology as the queen of the sciences at least in the social sciences, and perhaps in all the sciences. And they think economics can explain virtually everything. And they regard economics with a great deal of respect, particularly their own economics, maybe not yours or mine, but their own they respect very highly. Uh, and they regard everything else as inferior. Now, these same economists are very anti-Christian. Even uh, among economists, we would call conservative. People like Milton Friedman, for example. Uh, Milton Friedman taught economics for years at the University of Chicago, um, uh, generally regarded as a conservative economist, but very anti-Christian, very anti-theological. In fact, among academic economists, it became a swear word, theology did. If somebody were to start saying something with which they disagreed, which they thought didn't meet the definition of their science, then they would say to them, that's just theology. That's just theology, meaning that's nonsense. That's nonsense. And it became a curse word for even the conservative economists that came out of the University of Chicago, for example. And they've had a great deal of influence, uh, not only in this country, but in Latin America as well, the Chicago School of Economics. But economics is not the queen of the sciences. It's one of the, it's one of the lesser studies, one of the lesser disciplines. Uh, in that pamphlet back there, What is Christian Philosophy? I hope you read it carefully. You'll see there's a discussion of various branches 
of learning. Um, and economics fits in there somewhere, but it's certainly not anywhere near the top. Um, if we were to arrange the branches of learning uh, in a hierarchy, I would su uh, suppose that the base of all of learning would be the discipline called epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge. And then above this, you have the theory of reality, metaphysics. And above this, you have ethics. And above that, you have politics. Where does economics come in? Well, it's not even one of the big four in the branches of learning. It uh, fits in somewhere one supposes uh, up around politics and ethics, uh, if it fits in uh, very neatly at all there. There's another branch that uh, doesn't make the big four either. It's the study of beauty, called aesthetics. And if you're interested in art, you study the history of art or painting at uh, colleges, you'll be studying aesthetics, the theory of beauty. What, what makes something beautiful? What is beauty? And economics and aesthetics are both lesser disciplines in the hierarchy of academic discipline. Now, economics also is not to be confused with economic systems. We talk about the economy of the United States, a perfectly legitimate use of the word economy, but do not confuse economics and economy. Again, they're quite different things. Economics is a discipline. It's a body of propositions. Uh, another way of putting it is it's, it's a uh, collection of propositions, collection of ideas. Uh, the term itself really doesn't give us much help as to what it means. Does anyone know Greek here? Any Greek students? Yes, sir. Yeah, can you guess what Greek words economics comes from just by looking at it? Okay. Law or principle? Actually, it's it's not. Uh, the same word as we find in, in ecology or something like that. The, the Greek word is, I don't know if you can see it back there. That's the way you will see it if you look at how Plato and Aristotle uh, use the word. And it means simply household management. That's all it meant to them was how to manage your household. That was economics. Today we have the phrase home economics, which expresses much the same thing, how, how to manage your household, home economics. But economics as a, an academic discipline is quite different from home economics. But that's what it meant uh, to Plato and Aristotle. Now before I uh, open it up for questions here, um, one thing I'd like you to do this week, in addition to reading those uh, papers at the back on the table, make sure you pick up a copy of those and read them. But I'd like you to go through the Bible, go through the Bible, and bring in at least five passages that seem to have something to do with economics this week. Bring them in on, let me see, we'll be meeting Saturday, so bring them in on Saturday. I think we meet, what is it, uh, at 10 o'clock on Saturday, Frank? Start at 10 on Saturday. Um, during the week, it, we start at 4, but on Saturday it starts at 10. Bring them in on Saturday, if you would. Five passages from Scripture that seem to have something to do with economics. 
And as we go through the series of lectures this week, you'll get, I hope, a better and better idea of what economics is. I'll give you a very brief definition at this point as to what economics is. Economics is the study of the logic of choice. Economics is the study of the logic of choice. You probably didn't expect that. You probably thought I was going to say something about the Federal Reserve <laughs> and why it ought to be burned down and the ground on which it stands piled with salt. <laughs> uh, well, we may talk about money a little bit later in the week, but uh, we'll see how the time holds out. But it's the study of the logic of choice. And perhaps you've never thought of it, but there is a logic of making choices. Uh, and from that, we can deduce the principles of economics. As the Westminster Confession says, by good and necessary consequence. So what you end up with, or what we hope to end up with, or what I hope to give you an inkling of by the end of the week, is the idea that starting with Scripture, you can come up with a set of principles, a set of ideas, deduced from Scripture, that will explain virtually all the business phenomena that you see around you. In fact, it will explain and should make clear to you why you do your do certain things. And uh, usually students are very uh, surprised by the amount of information that you can get out of simply the idea of choice, making choices, making decisions. Now, this definition is quite different from what... Uh, other people have defined economics as, and in the next hour we'll go through some of those definitions that other people have offered. But are there any questions so far? I've, I've given you a list of things of what economics is not. And I've just given you a very brief definition of what it is and where we're going to be going this week. Uh, if you have a copy of this three-page syllabus, it will give you a much better idea of where we're going to be going uh, in this week. Uh, but are there any questions at all? We're not going to, I don't intend to jump into the middle of things and start talking about uh, why we need a gold standard. Uh, anybody can stand up here and harangue you about that, but it won't increase your understanding of the discipline of economics at all. And once you understand what economics is and the principles involved, then you yourself will be able to figure out who's snowing you on television or on the radio or in the newspaper and who isn't snowing you. Be very useful uh, in that regard. Any questions? Oh, okay. Is there any country in the world that operates under not to my knowledge. The, the question was, is there any country in the world that operates under Christian economics? Uh, I know of none, but maybe someone has better information. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, there, there are countries that have come close. Um, that is... The government has been limited to what the activities specified in Scripture are. Um, and there are countries that have come close. I, nobody has uh, been pure, but that's to be expected. Uh, it's an ideal toward which we ought to aspire, uh, not something that we realistically hope to attain uh, on earth. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, is econometrics a way of measuring choices? No, it's not. Um, you, you've hit upon the idea of econometrics. The metrics obviously means measurement of some sort. And um, 
the, one of the assumptions of the discipline of, economet of econometrics, or to use a similar phrase, macroeconomics, uh, is that the behavior of people can be treated as if they were um, inanimate objects. And we can treat uh, people the same way that the physicist treats uh, molecules or whatever. Um, there's no way of...